Hey, and welcome back to By Myself But Not Alone. This is episode 27, Cincinnati, Ohio. And before we get started, I've got three quick thank yous I'd like to make. The first one, I want to say thank you to my friend Wally in Texas. What he did was, after he saw the last episode, he was so touched by Gracie's story. He, he asked me for my address. He said he wanted to send me something. So I gave him my address. I didn't ask any questions. And a few days later, this arrived in the mail. Many of you might know what this is. It's, a, it's an S&M 2 print. Wally got three of them, one for himself and one for, for two friends. They pulled a fast one on us at the Met Club store. They went on sale overnight after I had already gone to bed. I didn't get one. It's a really cool print, as you can see. By the time I woke up, they were sold out. Wally saw me comment somewhere that I didn't get one. I slept right through it. And he said after he saw that Gracie episode, it, he just he wanted, to, he wanted to thank me somehow. And he decided to send me his personal print. Now, he doesn't have one. Wally, I just want to say thank you. That was, wasn't necessary, but I appreciate it more than I can say. And Mary, I know you're watching. I, I want to let you know that the, the comments about Gracie's episode just keep coming. And, and she moved a lot of people. So again, thank you, Wally. The next day when the mail arrived, I had another surprise. I got a box from my friend James Hatfield. Not Hatfield, Hatfield. This is Black Ticket Brother James. What he's been doing is he takes empty fifth bottles and he has a glass saw. He spends a lot of time. He cuts it off and then he sands it. Isn't that the coolest glass you've ever seen? And I want to say thank you, James. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Thanks for thinking of me and sending it. I appreciate it more than I can tell you. And finally, you know my friends Alexander and Jonathan, the two guys I chased the picks for throughout the tour. Well, their grandmother has become a huge fan of the, the, the Met Fan Mike channel, and she thought enough to have a, a Met Fan Mike face mask made for me. And I appreciate this so much. I've got two of them, actually. I should put it on, but I'm keeping this one. The one I wear is out in the car. But I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. And that's that. I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you to, to the three of you. I appreciate it, again, more than I can tell you. At the end of the last episode, we got up early, and we were on I-40 West before 8 o'clock. We had checked the forecast, and it looked like the entire time there was going to be a chance of some serious weather. We didn't really get into anything too serious, but throughout the whole trip, we were in and out of some pretty nasty spots. It started out as freezing rain, and then by the time we hit West Virginia, it turned into little ice pellets, which then turned into snow for the rest of the trip. The one consistent trend on that stretch was the closer we got to Cincinnati, the colder it got. And when I say cold, I mean cold. Oddly enough, the trip should have taken about eight hours, and even with the weather, that's about what it took. Maybe a little longer. I was kind of shocked. I know Michelle was shocked. She had kind of gotten used to not getting anywhere on time, but hey, that's what happens when you're traveling with a guy who really doesn't care what time it is, ever. I really think the key to that success was how cold it was. The absolute best place to be was in the car rather than roaming around every gas station and rest area we passed. Anyway, we made it to Cincinnati. We had an easy time finding our hotel. We got checked in. We had a little extra time, so we relaxed a bit. We got ready. We headed into town to a really cool little bar called Knockback Nats. When we got there, there was just a small group of black ticket holders, maybe 15 or 20. Matt from CID was there, and then a couple of Metallica's crew members were there. Once we got settled inside, a guy walked up to me and he said, Matt tells me you've made it to all the shows and you're doing them all. And I said, well, yeah, I've been to all of them so far and the plan is to do them all, but we've still got eight shows left, so let's hope for the best. He said, well, I just wanted to tell you that I talked to the bartender and, and all your drinks are on me tonight. I appreciate that you've been enjoying all the shows and I wish you the best on the rest of the tour. He didn't really look familiar, so I asked him about his role as a crew member and it made sense when he told me what he did. He was one of the techs that worked up under the stage, so obviously during the shows I wouldn't have ever gotten to see him. I thanked him for his gracious offer. I told him I was just going to have one drink because I was driving and the rest would be Pepsi, but I, I couldn't tell him how, how thankful I was for that. He completely understood that and he furthered the offer. He said, well, get your friend some drinks. It's, it's on me. And I just want to say again, that was unexpected and that was such a cool gesture. By that point on the tour and specifically on this leg, I was so beaten down that I never thought I would question this, but I, I'm 99.9% .9 sure his name was Tim. And if his name wasn't Tim, I apologize profusely, but if it was Tim, I want to say thanks, Tim. That was awesome. I also got to meet someone that many of the black ticket holders got to know and love over the course of this tour. 
Mr. Mike Schnapp. I'd been seeing him all over the place, but until that pre-party, I'd never gotten the chance to introduce myself. Now, this guy has a tremendous history on the metal scene, from working at Combat Records in their early years through the present. His entire career has been spent doing all sorts of things with all sorts of well-known metal bands. In one way or another, he's got connections to just about all of them. You just don't meet guys like Mike every day, so when you do, it's really an honor to get to sit and hang out with him, and there's no end to the possibilities of things you may learn about metal music and just music in general. And the absolute best part of it all was he's so down to earth. He's just a normal guy, as have been all of the crew members we've met over the course of the tour. They're just normal guys and girls, happy to be relaxing, hanging out with friends. So again, it was really great to meet you there that night, Tim and Mike, and I really enjoyed getting to hang out with you for the remainder of the tour at some of the pre-parties. We had a good time watching some of the braver members of the group rock the karaoke stage. Some people ate, most drank. Nothing too crazy, it was just a laid back evening in a really cool place in the company of some really great friends. Throughout the night, we kept our eye on the radar and eventually the snow started to fall. There came a point where it started coming down pretty good and based on what we were seeing on our phones, there was a chance it was gonna get heavy. At that point, most of us figured it'd probably be a good idea if we called it a night. We all said goodbye, headed our separate ways, knowing that we'd see each other again the next day. That's the greatness of pre-parties. Goodbye is never really goodbye. We didn't get a massive amount of accumulation, but on our way back, we were crossing that big bridge you'll see in a couple of the, the pictures in the video. When we were about halfway across that bridge, the snow just started coming down heavier than it did at any other point in the trip, and that combined with intense winds made it nearly impossible to see. It was like a 100% complete whiteout, and for just a few minutes, we found ourselves in that same panic mode as we had been in on Cabbage Hill at Dead Man Pass on that godforsaken mountain on our way to Washington. Fortunately for us, that didn't last too long, and we could at least see a couple car lengths ahead of us until we made it back to the hotel, which we finally did. When we got back to the hotel, my phone beeped, and it told me I had a message from my friend Bill. Now, many of you may know him by his real name, John Bidwell. He's the founder and chapter head of Wisconsin Whiplash. That's why I'm wearing the shirt for this episode. And there's a slightly comical reason why I call him Bill, so I might as well tell you that. I had seen him before the Madison show, but I didn't get to talk to him until afterwards. We're walking along back to the parking garage next to these two guys. I said, you're Rob Bradley from Chicago, right? Rob said, yep, that's me. And the guy walking with him, I said, and you're... Dennis? He just quietly said, no, it's John. <laughs> and I kind of laughed and I said, man, I'm sorry. I've been calling you Dennis in my head. I don't, I don't know why, but I can't, I can't stick your name. Once he said it was John, I remembered him from Facebook interactions. I explained to him that for whatever reason, with some people, I have a hard time remembering their name. And each time I had seen him that day, I, I, in my head, I called him Dennis. He said, nope, it's John. And that's about the point where we broke off. I saw him again in Minnesota. I said, hey, what's up? Uh, is it James? And he said, nope, John. This happened at each of the first five shows on the first leg and then into the second leg. And every time it happened, I called him a new name. Each time I said, man, I'm so sorry for whatever reason, I just can't remember your name. I'll get it one of these days and when I do, I'll never forget it. By the time we made it to Charlotte, when I got to the arena, I saw him sitting on a brick wall and I walked over and before I could say anything, he said, it's not Steve. And I said, no, it's John. John Bidwell. His eyes got big, he smiled, he said, damn, you finally got it right. I said, yep, John Bidwell is now etched in my brain, I will never forget it. Right about then, this other guy walked up and he asked us if that was the black ticket line. It was Matt Van Horn, it was the first time I had met him, so I, I asked him about the intro, black ticket intro, I explained to him about that, asked him if he'd be interested, he said, no problem. At that point, I looked over to my right and I said, have you met Bill? I really did not do that on purpose, and when I looked back at John, he had his head down and he was just shaking it. It was pretty funny. So ever since then, in any circumstance involving other people, I'll refer to him by his real name. Otherwise, they wouldn't know who the hell I'm talking about. But anytime I'd see him after that, the first thing I'd say is, hey, Bill, what's up? Or you know, I'd greet him as Bill. I also added him in my phone as Bill. But anyway, that's why I call John Bidwell Bill. So anyway, I popped open the message and he wanted to know if I'd ever had a chance to see the museum that's part of some of the enhanced experience packages. He had an upgrade that included a plus one. That means he gets to take someone with him. And he asked if I wanted to be that person. I got pretty excited. I hadn't had a chance to see the museum yet and I told him I'd be happy to split any cost involved. He said absolutely not. He didn't want anything for it. He said he'd been thinking that it would be a shame 
if I was to actually do all 35 shows and never got a chance to see the museum. I told him I really appreciated the consideration that I'd obviously be happy, more than thrilled to go with him. He said, right on, that's the plan. I'll meet you in line tomorrow. And that's what we did. When we woke up the next morning, we looked out the window and we were happy to see that there wasn't a massive amount of snow. But when we went outside, we saw how excessively cold it had gotten. I mean, it really seemed cold the night before, but it was just brutal as soon as we went outside. So we started messaging other people to see what time people were actually going to go out there and, and brave that cold. We got a message that had been circulating that explained that CID was acknowledging that the, the temperature was at dangerous levels. So they were going to do some sort of a line, line ticket deal where you, all you had to do was go to the arena, pick up your line ticket, and then, you know, before they opened the doors later in the day, they would honor the numbers on the tickets. So we jumped in the car, we headed down to the arena, and when we got out there, we were right next to the river, and it, it was almost unbearable. I couldn't imagine standing out in that line for any length of time. So uh, I was really happy for the number system, but I was even more happy that John couldn't have picked a better day to invite me as his plus one. We'd be getting to go in quite a bit earlier than the people that, even with a line ticket, they were still going to have to stand out there in line for a little bit. Right after we got our ticket, as we were heading back to the car, we ran into our friend Tommy Burke from Philadelphia. We had a long conversation of about 30 seconds. He was heading to get his ticket. We jumped in the car and headed back to the hotel. I didn't really feel like we had enough time at the hotel. I would have been happy to stay there the rest of the day. But we got ready. By the time we made it back to the arena, Rob Bradley and the crazy folks were already there. The wind was blowing even harder than it had been earlier that day. And I, I couldn't have imagined that it would seem any colder than it did that morning. But the temperature appeared to be dropping. At this point, I just wasn't sure I was going to make it. I'd already had two rounds of steroids and antibiotics since the tour had begun for my inner ear problems. And I knew exposure to this type of weather it just might be the end. It was just too cold that day to do any type of interviewing, so there are none in this episode. After what seemed like eternity, which was probably a little less than an hour, they started calling people with the whiplash experience, so John and I got to go line up inside. That was a lifesaver. I kind of felt bad for Michelle and the crew outside, but hey, what are you going to do? I was inside. It was nice and toasty warm in there. We got our little gift bag with our posters and Pretty soon they were taking us to the museum. When we finally got in, we were like kids in a candy store. We couldn't believe the amount of cool stuff that was in there. We both agreed that we could just stay there for the rest of the day and life would be good. There were instruments used on previous tours, performance wardrobes, cabinet after cabinet full of drawers that as you pulled them out, they were just full of a collector's fantasy of items like handwritten lyric sheets, previous tour itineraries, artwork from various known releases, demo tapes, tickets, flyers, and posters from the earliest shows, band members' personal ID laminates that started out with the earliest show IDs through current, and just so much more. I can make a whole episode explaining that to you. I believe this was John's first time in the museum, and there was just so much there. We were both equally excited. We, we just didn't really know how to handle the moment. They had a guitar station set up where you could actually put on the put on the headphones and, and plug in and, and hear yourself playing some of their actual guitars. I didn't do that because I didn't even know how to hold a guitar properly, but John, John had a, a really big time with that. It was fun to watch him enjoy it. We got our shirts. We had a couple drinks where we just kind of stood there and absorbed the moment. It, it was a really cool thing. And then we, we finally ran through quickly one more time to take a final look before we realized we, we needed to get in line. We knew that the experience included early entry and last thing we did on the way out, John jumped behind Lars's drum set, got a picture. Like I said, I don't even know how to hold a guitar properly, but I, I couldn't resist. There was a Dracula guitar there. I picked it up, smiled for a shot. Next thing you know, we're in a line that's being headed down to the arena. We finally made it in, we settled on the rail and in about 10 or 15 minutes, the black ticket and unforgiving experience people started coming in. Michelle found us instantly. She said, I'm so happy you saved me a spot. And I said, well, I didn't have much choice. I didn't want to end up stabbed to death with a butter knife in my sleep at the hotel tonight. The arena really filled up quickly and it wasn't much longer. And, and Jim Brewer was taking the stage and he did it in Cincinnati fashion. He came out in a Reds jersey. We all know what a big baseball fan he is. Diehard Mets fan. But in a couple cities on the tour, he came out in the local the local jersey and it was just really cool to see him come out in that Cincinnati Reds jersey. Now, I was always a die-hard Yankees fan. Sorry about that Jim. But the Cincinnati Reds were one of my other favorite teams. They might have been number two actually. In 1977 when I first got into Major League Baseball and fell instantly in love with it, that Reds lineup was fantastic. Pete Rose, Johnny Bench, Joe Morgan, Dave Concepcion, George Foster, and the manager 
the great Sparky Anderson. And in that moment, seeing Jim up there on that stage in that Cincinnati uniform, it took me way back. And as I looked around the arena, I realized that I was surrounded by people, many people whose earliest childhood memories contained those guys as their hometown heroes. And it was, it was really an honor to be in that crowd as a previous baseball fan and now a Metallica fan. I'm not the biggest sports fan anymore, but, but that moment, that jersey, thank you, Jim, that really took me back. I honestly believe that some of the other jerseys you wore throughout the tour did the same thing to many people. So good on you, Jim. That's a that's an element of your show that I'll never forget. Not just there in Cincinnati, but it was really special for me that night. So Jim and Joe got the crowd fired up in the fashion that we had come to expect. They did an awesome job. It wasn't much longer and we heard those angels singing and Metallica was on the stage giving it their all. The set list was as solid as any. I was kind of wondering if they might play Trapped Under Ice due to the weather conditions. It would have been great, but it didn't happen. Fight Fire with Fire was replaced by Spit Out the Bone as the first encore slot. Ride the Lightning was back in. The Memory Remains was back in and you should have heard that crowd sing back up. The massive choral voice that appears every time that song is played live is something to behold. And the single day event record-breaking crowd in Cincinnati of 16,587 people did not disappoint. There are three people in that crowd I'd like to mention that night. Our friend Charlie Carr, his brother Chad, and his sister Chanel. It was her birthday, so what better way to spend your birthday than with your two crazy brothers? In the video at the end of the episode, you'll see a picture of the three of them together that appears right after the cube pictures. Charlie provided those pictures and several others. Now, it wasn't the same case in Raleigh where my battery died, but in Cincinnati, I was about to die. So once the band came on, I, I really didn't pull my phone out too much. And when I went to make the video, I realized I could use a couple more pictures. So Charlie, I want to I wanna say thanks for providing those. And John Bidwell, Bill, also hooked me up with a couple. Pick time rolled around. I got my two Cincinnati picks and a couple extra, actually, that I got to send to some friends in Cincinnati after I got back home. One went to my friend Fade to Black 68. That's his Met Club forum handle. I, I've gotten to know him. He's been a tremendous supporter of the channel, which I appreciate. And we had we had planned on meeting at that show. It was his hometown show. But due to the weather conditions and just everything that was going on, that didn't happen. Sorry about that fade. Uh, we're going to hook it up at some point down the line, I certainly hope. I, I was able to get him a pick, though. And again, I appreciate your support of this channel since day one. After the show, we headed out to the car. We were parked 30 or 40 feet from the river. The wind was trying to kill us. I'm going to say it one more time. Cincinnati was cold. I need to shut up about it because there are no words to accurately describe it other than to say it was the coldest night of my life. As much as we wanted to get back to the hotel, we had one final stop to make. We stopped by our friend John Cooper's hotel. Our friend Ephra, who's one of the guys from Ecuador, when I met those guys originally, I said, hey, would one of you guys be interested in representing your country in the in an episode for Color Our World Black. And Ephra jumped all over that opportunity and he contacted me in between legs and he told me that he was actually gonna hand deliver it. He told me he was gonna be at the Cincinnati and Cleveland show. The way it turned out, uh, he was gonna be heading to the airport immediately after the Cleveland show, so that's why we had to stop by in Cincinnati. It would be the last opportunity. He didn't wanna actually take it to the show because then we'd both be stuck carrying more stuff around. So it just made sense for us to swing by the hotel. We went in, we did our trade. He gifted us some chocolate. As you may or may not know, some of the best chocolate on earth comes from South America. It, it was just unbelievable. Michelle and I both enjoyed that. Thanks, Ephra. I just want to let you know, I have not forgotten about you. You're going to be the first Color Our World Black and Trade. As long as it's taken me to get these episodes up, I figure I might as well just finish this series before we get back to that but I'm gonna be contacting you really soon. We finally made it back to the hotel. Michelle and I were both happy about the fact that we could sleep in a little bit the following morning. It was gonna be a short, short trip to Cleveland in comparison to some of the other trips we made. This was one of the only times on the whole tour where Michelle didn't have a bit of problem with my idea that we should probably just sleep in a little bit before we leave. Before we got on the highway, we stopped at the gas station right next to the hotel to top off the gas tank and to get some coffee. Michelle surprised me when she came out of the store, and this is a good example of why it's, it's always nice traveling with someone really close to your own age. I found out that morning in Cincinnati that Michelle is a Cracker Jack kid to, you know, the caramel popcorn, but more importantly, uh, every box comes with a prize. Back in the day, many of you old folks know that's all we had. The kids today are spoiled. They've got all kinds of edible goodies with toys inside. So when Michelle hopped in the car, she handed over the surprise. It was some little chocolate thing, and 
you have to break the chocolate off and there's a toy inside. She got one for herself and one for me. When she gave it to me, she said she was really starting to understand how easily amused I am. So she, she saw him sitting there and, and she grabbed a couple. I had to laugh at the way she said that and I said, aren't we easily amused? I see you got us each one. She told me to shut up and get my toy, so it didn't take me long. I had this cool little pig looking thing. It was a pretty nice prize. I was eating the chocolate. It tasted pretty good. I looked over and I'm like, man, you're slow. She was trying to get the box open. She finally got it open and when she did, she cracked that chocolate open and she seemed disappointed as she pulled out a rhino. I think this must go back to that gender Mars and Venus thing, I'm not sure. But when she pulled that rhino out, her bottom lip was poked out and I couldn't believe it. She seemed disappointed in her prize. She kept looking at the rhino and then she looked at me and said, do you want to trade? I looked at her like she was stupid and said, hell yeah, I want to trade. So we traded. We were both happy. We even ran back in and got one for the road. So I want to say thanks for that little surprise, Michelle. I, I know it wasn't uh, caramel popcorn, but I, I want to thank you for that Cracker Jack moment. I'll never forget it. So I'd like to say thanks to the Cincinnati crowd. It was a true pleasure to be in your company that night. And again, that nostalgic baseball flashback that I had, thanks to your Cincinnati Reds, I, I felt honored to be there that night. Black Ticket Brother Bill, I want to say thank you for your consideration in making me your plus one. I had a great time hanging out with you that day. I'm never going to forget that. Thank you. Charlie, I'd like to say once again, thanks for the pictures and the help with this episode. To everyone else, I'd like to say, as always, thank you for watching. If you like what we have going on here, we would appreciate it greatly. If you consider subscribing to the channel, give us a like, a dislike, whatever the case may be. Leave us a comment. Let us know how we're doing. If you should happen to find yourself in any of our videos, please feel free to share it to social media and help us grow the project. Next stop, Oh my God, it got colder. I didn't think it was possible. Cleveland, Ohio. We'll see you there. Until then, rock on.
You make us feel good, Cincinnati!